Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, normally, I do this YouTube video on uh, Employment Fridays. Uh, but today uh, we're doing it midstream because the markets have been so difficult and the economic data so confusing, uh, the market data, data so confusing. So uh, I guess I should have introduced myself, uh, Kathy Wood, uh, Chief Investment Officer of ARK Invest. Uh, so today uh, we have a very special, special guest. Her name is Nancy Lazar. Uh, she is the chief global economist for uh, Piper Sandler. I've known Nancy since 1982. We've both been in the business uh, for a long time and we've seen a lot of cycles and experienced a lot of markets. Uh, the reason I wanted to feature Nancy today is uh, because of what I've been describing for the last few months uh, uh, on this YouTube channel. Uh, as you know, uh, everyone looks at the same data. We all get the same data. The government puts it out. Uh, but different economists place a different emphasis on certain variables at certain points in the cycle. And uh, so we were watching uh, two points of view based on the same data. Uh, one was uh, we are back in the 70s environment inflation is uh, baked into the cake. It's going to be very difficult uh, to dislodge it. Uh, and uh, we're, we're probably in a, an environment where commodity prices, real estate, uh, tangible assets generally are going to do much better uh, than the, the financial markets. And um, so we were dealing with that scenario. And as you know, uh, we were looking at data and actually more than a year ago anticipated a very different world. Uh, what we didn't anticipate, of course, was uh, the extent and the length of time that we were going to see supply chain disruptions. And we certainly did not expect Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so those have been variables uh, you know, we've had to work through in terms of our own thinking about the future. Uh, but we, we did come to the same conclusion uh, that we were probably going to see more deflationary forces at the end of all of this uh, than inflationary forces. And uh, I believe that we are in the early stages of seeing that. Now, this, these are the early stages, but Nancy's view of the world uh, which she every week uh, puts into charts that really help evoke what's going on. Um, her view of the world was closer to this, uh, you know, inflation is not embedded in the system at a, at a rate much like the 70s. Well, hi, Kathy. Thank you very much uh, for asking uh, me to uh, be on this uh, discussion with you today. Really, really appreciate it. And there's certainly a lot of very, very interesting things going on and some disturbing things, quite frankly, that are going on. And so there are many drivers of economic activity, but perhaps the two most important are both monetary and fiscal. Let's start out with the monetary side of the equation, which is uh, page two. And on the monetary side, the Federal Reserve is now raising interest rates. But actually, that's in a background of other central banks that have been raising rates already for over a year. Uh, we've counted over 180 central bank tightening moves. That is 180 interest rate increases over the past year, uh, not 180 central banks. There are many central banks have actually raised rates uh, uh, several, several times, which is now what our Federal Reserve is just starting to do. But we are a global economy, and it is global rates that drive uh, our economy. And it's not the level of rates. Here you see global short rates are still very, very low. Many of you would think 1.8%. Uh, gee, that's much lower than mortgage rates. What's wrong with that? But they've increased. It's the change in interest rates when you go from 0.8% to 1.8. It's that increase that changes behavior, that impact negatively impacts economic activity. And it doesn't happen immediately. It takes time. It takes roughly a year to change behavior. And so we are right now in a period where the economy is already starting to slow. You've certainly seen that with a lot of company news where their earnings are starting to get hit and overall economic activity is starting to slow. Um, and now the Fed is starting to raise rates. That's very different when they last had a tightening cycle, which was back in 2016. 
they were raising rates into an accelerating economy, and that gave them a couple of years of higher interest rates without really disrupting uh, the markets or economic momentum. That's not the case today. Uh, the economy is already slowing. Why is it already slowing? Uh, again, because global central banks have been tightening for a year. You also have higher bond yields. You have higher oil prices. All those things lead growth, and they are now in the prospect uh, of, of slowing economic activity. And now the Fed is stepping in and raising rates. We would argue they're late, uh, and these, these higher interest rates that they're putting in place risk creating financial strains. Um, and in turn, we don't think the Fed is going to be able to raise rates as much as they currently suggest, say around 200 basis points, um, because between now and then, there's going to be clear signs that the economy is slowing, and even inflationary pressures are, are going to are going to uh, come down. So we will get another rate hike, most likely in, in February and probably even in August. We're not so sure how aggressive the Fed's going to be able to be in the, in, in the fourth quarter, because we think by then it's going to be pretty clear both growth and inflation are slowing pretty uh, are slowing pretty uh, significantly. Yeah, uh, Nancy, I am. Uh, I'm also struck. Uh, uh, the Fed is really focused on the U.S., but uh, I think Europe is in a recession. China. Some of the numbers coming out of China are shocking as well. That has an impact on the rest of Asia. So they're th what they're facing is a recession, and their currencies are dropping. Their currencies are dropping relative to the dollar which uh, means their purchasing power is going down. Uh, but it also means that some of them are tightening more because their currencies are falling against the dollar. Uh, so it's a bit of a vicious cycle. And uh, as Nancy says, I agree with you, Nancy, we are not alone. Many people are thinking about the US in isolation. Uh, we've already had one quarter of negative GDP, which most people brushed aside saying, oh, that's a, uh, that that's a fluke. And, uh, you know, I don't think I think that was a real number and we should not dismiss it. So uh, agree with you totally, uh, Nancy. And, and, and I would agree with you that Europe is in a, already in a recession, uh, to be sure. And don't forget the strength in the dollar to the extent their currencies are weaker. The strength in the dollar is, is actually uh, another disinflationary event here for the United uh, for the United States. So that just further increases the odds that we can see inflation slow uh, pretty pretty quickly. Yeah, along with I was just going to say, in the old days, you know, in past cycles, many people thought that the dollar going up was a was a, the same as you know monetary tightening. It's a disinflationary force, uh, and it's up fifteen percent uh, since the bottom, which is a huge increase for the dollar in such a short period of time, and really hurts emerging markets. Absolutely, the, the the dollar going up means uh, that our imports from abroad are going to be cheaper, and just makes it easier. And at the same time, the dollar going up further hurts corporate corporate profits, and we're going to get to that. Uh, we're going to get to that in a in a minute. But the other major policy driver of the U.S. economy um, is classically fiscal policy. And if we uh, go to the next slide, fiscal policy was really aggressive. Uh, as many of you know, uh, be either for small businesses or even big businesses, but also obviously individuals. And so government spending exploded, uh, particularly in 2001, but started in 2000. So we had two years of very, very aggressive fiscal stimulus that went in directly into consumers' hands. Um, and indeed, they were able to spell, uh, spend it very, very, we were be able, able to uh, spend it very, 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 very quickly. But this is very different, uh, Kathy, you mentioned the 60s and 70s. This is very different than the 60s and 70s. You had sustained increases in government spending, starting with guns and butter in the back half of the 60s. And then unfortunately, uh, Richard Nixon just basically took over the Fed uh, and accelerated both government spending and, uh, and money supply. Uh, net for about 15 years, starting the back half of the 60s throughout the 70s, you had aggressive, very aggressive, very rapid money uh, money supply growth uh, and government spending on a sustained basis. And I'm using that word on purpose because that is not what we had in 2021. It was basically a whipsaw. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to get into whether or not it was good or bad. I would argue uh, that it was too much in uh, March of 2021. 20, uh, the economy was already starting to heal. Uh, but nonetheless, it is what it is. Um, 
And I agree with your point, Kathy, that uh, this gave the consumer firepower to buy a lot of stuff. Um, and then you had the uh, port disruptions both here and in China shutting down of the ports. And that uh, indeed uh, created a shortage of goods. And so the consumers had a lot of money. They were buying a lot of stuff, but it wasn't all available from bike prices uh, to, to clothing. Uh, prices, obviously used car prices rose very sharply because we had the money to actually spend. Well, and it's very, very, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say the dotted line here uh, yeah. gives uh, gives our viewer uh, viewers a sense of how restrictive uh, spending is now, right? No, oh, ex exactly. That's what the dotted line is measuring. It's first, it measured the surge, measured the stimulus, and you can see the the orange line uh, uh, helped to drive uh, overall economic activity up uh, very, very, very strongly. But absolutely, to Kathy's point. Uh, the, the dotted line is now declining dramatically. Government spending is actually negative uh, 20 percent this year. Uh, and from a fiscal uh, perspective, from an economic headwind perspective, that in and of itself takes about three percentage points off of GDP this year. And so I would actually say this is at risk of creating a recession, potentially even more than the Fed, uh, because this is happening right now. Many people are struggling because those stimulus checks are gone. Um, and many people are struggling because obviously inflation has uh, surged and that's cut into real purchasing power. And a big reason is how quickly this government spending has gone from being very stimulative to be very restrictive. And a lot of that excess savings has been eaten up by, by inflation. Um, and we're now, a lot of people are struggling as a result of this fiscal, this massive fiscal drag. So the Fed is tightening into a period uh, of when fiscal policy is also even more of a headwind than currently the, 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 Fed, uh, the, Fed, the Fed is. Yeah, and uh, it, it strikes me that, uh, uh, that those who are listening will say, oh my gosh, this is, this is terrible, and, and it is in one way. But one of uh, the things we're focused on is what will get the Fed to stop tightening or at least change its rhetoric. And uh, I think as these, uh, these forces put pressure on the economy, um, and you get companies like Walmart and Target reporting uh, terrible numbers from two points of view. Uh, and I know Nancy is going to go into some of this, but uh, their sales up 3% year over year. Well, inflation uh, itself is up, uh, if you look at the CPI, 8%. Now, they're not passing all of that through, but uh, I am sure that they are passing more than 3% uh, through. So that means their unit sales, their real sales, are declining on a year-over-year -year basis uh, while inventories are ballooning. And we think that those two factors, and now the Fed must be aware of them because Walmart such a big and Target such big companies, uh, those two factors probably have gotten the Fed thinking, um, my goodness, are we, are, we, are, we, are we overdoing it here? Well, to your point exactly, let's go to the next slide. And you can actually visually see this is not uh, a unique situation for Walmart or Target. It is a very broad-based situation where these uh, you have a surge in inventories as demand for a lot of this stuff we bought because we were staying at home is starting to uh, actually fade. So inventories uh, usually do grow. Companies do keep stuff uh, in the back in the back rooms, but they're 10% higher than they were. Uh, uh, before the pre before before the COVID crisis, and so 10%. These are not small numbers. These are huge numbers. And again, to uh, Kathy's point, these are the number of widgets in the back room. They are a number of of leggings. They are not uh, uh, dollar values. This is adjusted for adjusted for inflation. So it's the amount of stuff. It's up 10%. They've got uh, too much stuff. Uh, the bottom chart looks at sales, and again, this is a broad-based problem. Unit sales have basically been unchanged for a year. Uh, they are still 7% higher, so companies still feel good about their sales. But the point is, the economy is now reopening, and our incomes are getting squeezed because of inflation. We are getting ready to travel, have been traveling, so we don't need all that stuff. And so we are expecting sales actually to move down uh, towards uh, the trend line that it was. At the same time, inventories are very high. Now, what does that mean? That means the demand is now greater than supply. 
pardon me, demand is now weaker than supply. Just the opposite. Just the opposite of a year ago. A year ago, demand was greater than supply, and that put upward pressure on price. Today, demand is much weaker uh, than supply. And so in our world, we like to look at well, what are inventories relative to sales? Uh, and you can see uh, after being well below trend, again, companies didn't have enough stuff. Now they have too much. Um, and these trends are going to last. It could take time for sales to continue to weaken. Uh, companies potentially double ordered. We actually have data suggesting we're importing an awful lot of stuff right now. 40% uh, surge in consumer good imports. That's going to end up being in inventories. And so what will companies do? What are, how do companies deal when they have too many inventories? Well, as you, Walmart just said it. They're rolling back prices. So, Kathy, I don't know how long it's going to take the Fed to realize that. We think they're looking at specifically core CPI. Um, and they need a string of, of numbers where core inflation on a month-to-month -month basis is something uh, closer to 0.2. By core, I mean X food and energy, which is what the Federal Reserve tends to look at. Uh, and they want that to move down toward 2% on a sustained basis. We think they're going to get there because companies are already here in May starting to cut prices. We've already seen used car prices come down. They, they became too expensive. Um, and so we think as we go through the summer, we're going to start to see these point twos, maybe not April, uh, pardon me, maybe not May, uh, but as we get into June, July, we think we're going to start to see another shift down in inflation because companies have to get rid of all this stuff and they're going to start to cut price. Well, one of the things that would be interesting to know is uh, have we ever seen inventories, Target or, or Walmart, have their inventories ever increased this much. Uh, so Target's inventories, their unit sales were probably down. 3% uh, 3. 3 uh, was the dollar value, but in units, probably down. Uh, and their inventories were up 42%. So take away inflation, that's 30 to 35% on a year over year basis. Uh, I do not believe we've ever seen that before. And these are well-managed companies. And so what I think happened was human beings overruled their, uh, uh, en their enter enterprise resource planning systems, their software, and, and they did double order and triple order. Uh, I know that Target said part of the disappointment uh, in sales and earnings was they had to start marking down goods in order to start clearing shelves. And even with marking down in April, these are through April, uh, their inventories were up 42%. Walmarts were up 33%. Home Depot's up 32%. Uh, so much for supply chain problems. I mean, those, those at least in the case of those three companies, uh, the supply chain issues are disappearing. And, and one last point, on used cars in particular, uh, you know, I think a lot of people bought a, that extra car because they didn't want to take mass transit. And they saw prices go up, so they actually made some money on those early purchases. I wouldn't be surprised if they now, now that mass transit is open much more, they start selling into the used car market where used car sales are already down 20%. I wouldn't be surprised to see an implosion in those prices. Yeah, no, that is clearly a bubble, and bubbles classically do pop. And I would totally agree with you uh, after going up 50%, why they don't go down uh, double, uh, double, double digit. But to your point, it's been a long time since companies have had to deal with inventories. When you and I first started out in the business, inventories were always a part of a discussion and you would always have inventory swings, either helping boost and then eventually hurting economic growth. But that really stopped. Um, and the last one we've had uh, was Y2K and that was 30 years ago. And I'm not sure how many managers remember uh, that all of a sudden they can end up with too many inventories. So uh, this is a unique situation for many of them. Uh, but nonetheless, the consequences are they, they want to clear a shelf and they're going to cut uh, and they are already starting to cut, uh, uh, cut, uh, cut price. Um, so what does this do, though, to corporate profits, as you're suggesting? And that's that's the next page. When you have revenue growth slowing, unit sales stalling, uh, yet costs up dramatically because they they, they hired a lot of people uh, and they also uh, raised wages, what you're really setting yourself up for is a pretty significant decline in corporate profits. 
And I, I don't think this is yet recognized that profits in the first quarter actually uh, did decline. Again, I don't understand that. We just heard uh, s several very big prominent companies suggest their profits were weak uh, in the first quarter, if not actually down sequentially. I believe even Amazon was down sequentially. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, that is what happens. Uh, company profits are cyclical. They are tied to uh, the overall economic activity, obviously. Um, when economic activity booms, we have some great companies in this country. Their profits can classically do very, very well, very, very focused on productivity. Um, but again, the, this is a little bit of a unique event. Uh, there were people who were reluctant to work, and so because of the COVID situation, um, and therefore companies had to uh, scramble and raise wages uh, more than they otherwise would have. Um, while revenues were growing double digits, supported by all of the stimulus checks, that was fine. Um, but now again, at this uh, inflection point where growth is slowing because of, uh, very clearly because of the fiscal stimulus, again, you don't have those checks that you had a year ago. You, 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 your stimulus checks directly boosted corporate profits because you went to stores and you, and you spent it. Uh, so today, as a result of that and higher prices, you're cutting back. That is affecting that is affecting the profit backdrop. And at the same time, again, companies have too many inventories, and so now, if anything, they're going to start to cut price. So we are setting the stage for uh, multiple quarters. We would we we believe of a decline actually in corporate uh, in corporate profits. So uh, if anything, 2022 is almost just the opposite of 2021 in many many ways. Um, uh, and, and, and again, uh, these are at the leading edge. I'm not sure, uh, again, maybe after the past two weeks, this is increasingly being recognized, but up until the past two weeks, uh, this really wasn't being recognized that we are going to see a decline in corporate profits. And that's going to have uh, unfortunate uh, economic consequences also. Again, it's been very easy to get jobs uh, in 2021. We think that's going to change here in 2022. Uh, we are actually already seeing signs where companies are putting in place hiring freezes. Many of these big retailers are putting in place hiring freezes. And that's stage one. Stage two is that if this profit decline continues, you actually could see an increase uh, in the unemployment rate, a, a sharp slowdown, if not outright decline. Uh, in the number of people hired. I know that is a very, very, very out of consensus call, but it all starts with profits. And if companies can't make money, they do cut costs. Um, and that includes, uh, and that unfortunately includes uh, wages. And, and I would say, I, I, I don't think this is such an egregious uh, point, and even though it's not talked about much, because top, uh, top chart here, left-hand chart, um, is um, uh, business confidence. And it did actually drop. Uh, in the back half of 2021 and dropped sharply in the first quarter of 2021. So I find it a little peculiar that uh, there weren't more companies, say, warning about uh, their earnings estimates, because certainly in the first quarter, many, many businesses uh, uh, did see something wrong. And that's why business confidence declined uh, as much as as much as it as it has. Now, the data that I'm using um, is broad economy corporate profits, not just for the stock market. Um, stock market earnings, at least through the fourth quarter, were still up. But uh, uh, based on information that we have, we think actually even in the first quarter, S&P earnings were probably also down sequentially, not year over year. Uh, at turning points, you have to look at what's happening month after month, quarter after quarter. And uh, we do think first quarter earnings were probably down for the stock market and will probably continue to decline here in 2021. Yeah, I'll just add a, a few things. The uh, corporate profits after tax adjusted for IVA and CCA that is a very good measure of underlying profitability. And Nancy, I think, backed into what uh, the first quarter number was. She's usually very close. And if you, it looks like it's just hooked over a little bit. Uh, now, this is seasonally adjusted. So, uh, uh, But if you do the quarter to quarter at an annual rate percent change, that drop was 25% from the fourth quarter to the first quarter. And I am sure that has been a giant head fake for corporations, and that's why uh, confidence has dropped so much. Uh, the other thing I'll say is, you know, during, during tough times, innovation gains traction. And so in the retail sector, which we focused on in terms of, uh, in terms of the inventory excesses, we are also beginning to wonder if um, if the there's an accelerated shift now taking place to online, now that energy prices have soared 
And because if you look at total online sales as a percent of retail sales, uh, that number in the United States is 14, 15%. In China, it's more like 45%. Normally, when you get a trend, a consumer trend moving to, to, through that 15% mark toward 20, uh, it's a trend that's moving into overdrive. So those brick and bricks and mortar retailers who enjoyed such a nice rally last year as people were going back to stores and so forth, uh, they are probably now facing a day of reckoning. These energy prices are preventing trips to stores. Uh, and so we would not be uh, surprised to see a lot of carnage in the retail sector. Again, we always say innovation solves problems. Uh, and in this case, uh, consumers ordering, uh, ordering uh, goods from home is probably taking, uh, taking place at an accelerated rate. And this will also affect eventually manufacturing activity too, right? Because someone made all this stuff. Um, and so this will spread into, into other, unfortunately, into, into other, uh, other sectors. But it really is this backdrop uh, where if you go to the next page, again, if you notice the Fed is tightening into uh, a slowing economy because global central banks have been tightening, Fed is tightening while you have a very, very significant fiscal drag. Government spending is declining in this country while the Fed is raising, uh, raising rates. You have companies have too many inventories. And so very different than the 19, uh, than the 19, uh, 70s, 60s and 70s. Um, and we do think uh, that inflation will also very quickly slow given everything that we've just looked at. Headline may stay more elevated. As of April, the headline CPI, and I apologize for the noise, there's somebody upstairs doing construction. Um, the, uh, the April CPI was still up about 8.3% uh, 8 on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, month over month, headline was actually pretty tame, uh, only 0.2. Uh, the Fed strips out food and energy. They think that uh, those are sometimes can be exogenous shocks, and, and, and that does appear to be what's going on with food and energy prices, both in part related to what's going on, unfortunately, in Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, it is uh, core, uh, though also similarly accelerated very sharply, reflecting the demand for all the goods. And in April, it was actually a bad number. Month on month, it was up 0.6. Year over year, it was at 6.2. What the Fed is looking at is what those readings do sequentially. And so that 0.6% uh, definitely opened the door for the Federal Reserve to do 50 basis points and to tighten again probably another 50 uh, as we go into uh, the summer. Uh, that 0.6 month on month is a very, very high number. They are looking for that number to move down towards 0.2%. And given the backdrop that we've just uh, highlighted, we think that does start to unfold in the summer. Uh, near term, uh, hotels, airfares, unfortunately, may continue to go up. I, I don't know if you all have noticed, they're egregious. Um, but again, this is a very different backdrop than 2021. Uh, the travel and leisure industry doesn't have uh, that consumer with a, with, a, with, with a stimulus check, with a lot of savings, with wages going up aggressively and employment very, very strong, income growth for the consumer. Nominal income growth for the consumer this year is down to 4%. Last year it was double digit, 10 to 17%. Um, that gave consumers firepower to, for temporarily anyway, to uh, pay, pay higher prices. They don't have that today. So we're actually worried that uh, consumer, I call it, you got a new smarter consumer, um, that you may take a vacation because you haven't had one in, in, in a couple of years. But uh, as far as really splurging on vacations, they're pretty much making it impossible because prices have gone up so much as your income has gotten hit significantly. That along with uh, the excess supply we have today um, and, and all, the, all the goods, we do think there will be a sharp slowdown in inflation back down uh, below 2% as we move through the end of, uh, as we move through the end of the year. Yeah, Not I, at all like the 70s, sorry. Yes, yes, and I, this is the biggest controversy at, in the marketplace right now. Uh, so in the former camp that I described uh, earlier, uh, they have inflation really quite sticky up here. Uh, and of course, the, the second scenario that Nancy is describing here has a quick unwind in the inflation. And my confidence in this scenario has increased tremendously uh, after seeing uh, those inventory numbers at, at, at uh, Target, Walmart, 
uh, and Home Depot. I mean, those are very large uh, organizations, national, and they have a very big problem, bigger than I have ever seen. The reason a lot of people think uh, core CPI will be sticky is uh, rents, because housing prices have gone up so much, rents have gone up so much. I think what's going to going what's going on on the good side is going to overwhelm what's going on on the rent side, and uh, we're even seeing signs in some places that the consumer just can't pay up for these rents anymore. You're seeing a lot more mobility, and I have a feeling even rents are going to start uh, uh, adjusting. Oh, we I, I agree with you, uh, Kathy. That. You are already seeing uh, some weakness in housing activity. House sales are down. Housing starts are now flat to down. Housing gets hit first when you see a backup in interest rates. Um, shelter, uh, the service prices have already been accelerating. Uh, we think they go up maybe just a little bit more and then actually slow as we go into 2023. So we think the inflation outlook for 2023, in part because then you start to see some service, lower service inflation, could will be even lower than it is uh, in 2020 and 2020, uh, 2022. So this is one of the charts. Uh, if this plays out the way that you forecasted here, Nancy, and I, I, I think it will, um, this is why the Fed will uh, will relent. First, they'll relent in terms of their rhetoric. You'll hear them talk, well, maybe we don't have to go up as much. But my guess is they will stop their tightening moves uh, at some point this year altogether. And uh, the market is, the stock market is, uh, discounts the future. The stock market is, is looking very carefully at these numbers to discern trends out there. And as soon as the stock market understands that inflation is going to unravel and that the Fed is actually going to uh, relent uh, because they are making a mistake here, and I really do believe they are now making a mistake, tightening into the teeth of what seems to be a very significant slowdown and inventory um, bulge in the economy. Uh, I think that the equity market is going to take off again. But what we will see first is a, a rotation. And, you know, on certain days we're seeing it, but the, the last year has been all about cyclicals and value stocks. There will be a rotation back to growth stocks because if Nancy's right, if we're right, growth is going to become very scarce out there. And so that true growth companies with strong revenue growth in the 20% plus range, to the extent uh, there are companies like that out there, they will be rewarded handsomely as the market shifts away from value back to growth. And and it can happen very quickly because algorithms are also trained to to uh, to behave this way. Last year, it was straight up and to the right for cyclicals and value, and the momentum carried them uh, probably too far, given what's happening with inventories. And the same can happen in the other other direction. And is there's a chance the bond market has actually also figured oh. this out? The Fed is going to go too far, and you see that on the on the next page. Um, you have had an increase in bond yields around the world, um, but the bond bond market has <clears throat> bond yields have actually ticked down uh, a little bit. I think the ten year was at three fifteen, three twenty at one point, and now you're back below three. Um, and so we do think uh, bond the bond market may be figuring this out. We'll we'll, we'll see. Um, but uh, and and we would have t the ten-year yield actually moving back down towards two percent uh, by the end of uh, by the end of this uh, by the end of this year. Yeah, and I uh, everyone's been watching the ten-year Treasury uh, bond yield like like hawks, and those in the first camp were sure that it was going to break the downtrend that's been in place. Uh, really, if you go, you, you have to go back to 1981 to see the beginning of the downtrend. Uh, the, the Treasury bond yield peaked at around 15 percent back then. Uh, and it's been the trend has been down. Uh, I think those expecting a breakout uh, are, are being disappointed as we speak. And I'm surprised that the stock market isn't picking up more on this uh, because uh, interest rates, uh, the long term Treasury uh, yield, this one, went to 320 and now has backed down to 280. 
so that, that's 40 basis points in uh, maybe two weeks, uh, which is a very rapid move. So the bond market, and remember, this is a 10-year treasury yield, and I always like to think of it in terms of, okay, this is what the bond market thinks nominal GDP will be doing for the next 10 years, uh, give or take. So 3% or 2.8% nominal GDP growth over the next 10 years, um, well, that must mean uh, one of two things. Either growth is disappointing or inflation's disappointing or both. Or if in, you're in our world, in the disruptive innovation world, we think unit growth measured correctly is going to surprise hugely on the high side of expectations and that uh, inflation is going, to, uh, is going to turn down. And we would not be surprised over time to see it go negative once more because disruptive innovation is becoming a much bigger base in the economy. Electric vehicles, when we first started uh, ARC, weren't even, uh, they, they, they were probably not even 20,000 vehicles. That was 2014. Uh, last year, we were up at 4.8 million units. This year, we think we could be close to 7.5 million units globally as the consumer preference shift accelerates towards electric. And so, you know, that's approaching 10% of all auto sales. Wow. Uh, so I'm, I'm totally on board. We have uh, what we call is the uh, manufacturing renaissance, which uh, the digitization theme, the robotics theme, where uh, one thing the COVID crisis did do to be sure, uh, pulled it uh, definitely companies realized the importance of uh, automation, digitization, making their businesses more productive. Um, and at the same time, we have an onshoring into this country, which is, uh, creating a lot of good jobs uh, in the middle part of this country. And uh, uh, so capital spending, we think, uh, secularly will be strong. Cyclically, it's also going to slow, we think, here in 2022, 2023. But, but uh, companies uh, definitely are embracing uh, autom autom automation, uh, robotics, et cetera, digitization, use, utilization of computers, et cetera, to run your, business, to run your businesses. So longer term, we have a, a pretty optimistic uh, but uh, unfortunately, we, we, we need to squeeze out inflation. We, we think it is better to have a low inflation. I think your deflation outlook, uh, uh, Kathy, good gosh, isn't that great if prices go down? What's wrong with, what's wrong with low inflation if the economy is healthy? Um, and, and I would agree with that outlook. Yeah, and we know that the dollar is uh, up 15%. That's a powerful anti-inflationary force. Uh, we mentioned the 10-year uh, bond yield. Uh, saying, uh, Fed, you might be making a mistake here. Uh, and we're, we're beginning to see that in other fixed income metrics, like the yield curve. The yield curve has flattened from 150 basis points uh, more than a year ago down to roughly 20 basis points. Uh, it went negative for a minute. Uh, but uh, this what this also means is the, the bond investors believe that inflation or growth is going to be disappointing. Uh, and so, so that's interesting. Um, typically when the yield curve uh, goes negative, there is a recession within the 12 to 18 months. And that's certainly post-World War II experience. If we're right, uh, um, we're going to revert to something like the early 1900s experience where if, if these deflationary forces start dominating, that we could have inverted yield curves more often than not. In the 50 years ended in 19, I think, uh, 25, uh, the yield curve wa was inverted 60% of the time, and the average inversion was 100 basis points. That certainly will be a new world. And I think the other variable we're seeing here credit default swaps, um, those are breaking out. These are insurance policies uh, that investors take out against bankruptcy. And even JP Morgan, I took a look at that. Uh, now, banks are very well capitalized. Uh, we're trying to figure out why this is happening. But JP Morgan's credit default swaps uh, are, are priced today above where they were in the fourth quarter of 2018, when the market absolutely fell apart, and uh, are moving towards COVID highs. Now, why is that happening? 
uh, I think there are a lot of deflationary forces out there. And if there are deflationary forces and a company has leveraged up to buy back shares and cater to short term oriented shareholders, then uh, they are going to have to service that debt uh, by cutting prices on products that are probably going obsolete or that are uh, uh, are over inventoried right now. Uh, so I think we're going to hear a lot more about deflation. And I think you should be very watch very carefully the leverage uh, in your companies uh, and uh, whether or not their products uh, are in an over inventory uh, situation or whether they're going uh, to be obsolete uh, because of innovation. And I'll just give one more example. We got another report this week. Cisco Systems, uh, technology bellwether, uh, not so much a technology bellwether, but a GDP bellwether. That's at least how it describes itself. It, its revenues trade much like nominal GDP does uh, globally. And uh, expectations for this last quarter were up five and a half percent in revenues. They were flat. Their revenues were flat and they cut their estimate for the next quarter from five and a half percent to anywhere from minus one and a half percent to minus five and a half percent. Now, what is that? Is this a GB GDP harbinger? It might be. We do think that GDP is going to slow down quite a bit. But in our view, here's disruptive innovation at work once again. We are going through the first rip and replace cycle, capital spending cycle in the enterprise communication space since the early 90s when Cisco was building out the backbone for the internet. Uh, now Cisco is being disrupted. Uh, so it is very much hardware centric and on-prem in its focus. Uh, enterprise communications like all technology is moving into the cloud. And I often say it's going to feel chaotic because even our economic statistics are not set up for what's about to happen. They were born out of the industrial age and they're having trouble measuring the digital age. They're missing a lot and it takes them five to 10 years to catch up to, to reality. And in the meantime, they have all of the tax, uh, tax information on income and profits generally out there. So what we think is happening is uh, they, they are, uh, the, the GDP statistics uh, are, as they are reported today, are showing higher inflation than is really the case and lower output growth than is the case. Uh, and, uh, and so again, confusing to the Fed, confusing to everyone, but not confusing to us because we're focused solely on disruptive innovation. And you know, uh, I, I will end here before thanking Nancy, I will, I will end here on this notion that innovation is going to solve a lot of our problems. And we have a lot more problems since COVID given the supply chain issues, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, zero COVID tolerance now again in China. So uh, we, we have a lot more problems to solve. And uh, I think uh, Nancy's idea of this reshoring, the, the manufacturing renaissance here in the United States is going to be a boon for our country. It's going to hurt other countries, but a boon for our country. I think that's one of the reasons the dollar is going up. And uh, I think that our productivity gains are going to be enormous because, you know, we lost a lot of the industrial world to other countries. Now we can rebuild it here with state of the art technology. And that's very exciting from a productivity point of view. So Nancy, uh, I want to thank you once again. You've brought to life many of, through these charts, many of uh, the topics that I discuss without charts. Uh, I know that uh, your, your uh, business is dedicated to helping figure out where the truth is. And I think you've done a magnificent job in the last year sorting out the signal from the noise. Uh, now, we can't declare victory yet, uh, because inflation hasn't come crashing down. Uh, but I think we both believe it's going to be a, a big surprise and that it will be extremely positive for the equity markets and for the fixed income markets.
Thank you very much, Kathy. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you.